Today is the 26th day of November 2014. We are here at Savitri Bhavan. For me, one of the great lights of Oroville, next to the Madhramandir. And I'm very happy today and honored to have with us Shadavan whose vision created Savitri Bhavan. Shadavan, when did you first hear of Mother and Sri Aurobindo? Uh, in 1969. It was probably in April or May, and somehow I like to think that it was on the 23rd of April, <laughs> 1969. And... Uh, How did it come about? Yes, how did it come about? I was uh, living in London with my partner of those days. And one Sunday afternoon, uh, we, we just decided to drop in on some people that we knew, living in a flat in Earl's Court. Mm. But when we uh, got there, we found that there was a talk going on, completely unexpectedly. Ooh. And uh, we had missed the beginning, so I didn't know what the talk was about or who were the people. But what I heard over the next uh, 45 minutes seemed to answer all the questions that I had about the future of my life, the course of my life, what to do with my life. So at the end of the talk, I rushed up to the gentleman who had been speaking, and I said, who were you talking about? Who was that? And he said, Sri Aurobindo. Oh. And I was astonished. I thought, I've been searching for, uh, by that time, I think seven or eight years, and I've read everything, and I've uh, looked everywhere. How come that somebody like that existed and I had not heard about him? How old were you then? I think I was 26. And uh, I guess you found bookstores with this book? Well, at that time, this is an interesting part of the story, that mm. at that time there weren't any bookstores in London oh. where you could buy Shobindo's books. Fortunately, the gentleman I... Uh, I met, uh, you might have known him, his name was Jobst Mühling. He was in the ashram in the 50s. Uh, he was carrying quite a lot of smaller books with him, um, Basis of Yoga, Shobindo's Letters, and um, Nolini's series, The Yoga of Sri Aurobindo, and he had a copy of The Practical Guide to Integral Yoga. So he used to lend me these books and I would read them on my way on the tube in London to and from my work, which was, um, I worked in the Library Association, which is near to the British Museum. So those tube journeys were um, important. And one of them was particularly important because on my way home one afternoon, I had I believe it was Basis of Yoga with me. Mm. And one of those letters there um, yes. made me know why I had been born. It was written there in the letter. And I said, but that's it, Lord. That's, that's why I came. So that was a really, I mean, these two things together were life-changing moments. Yes. And uh, so instead of going straight home, I went and visited our friend Jobst, and I told him uh, wh what was my experience. And he said, if it is like that, then you must take the synthesis of yoga and you make that your Bible. Ooh. So that was when we discovered that um, you couldn't buy the synthesis of yoga in London. Um, 
which is another part of the story. First, I will say that after that meeting, that Sunday afternoon meeting, Jobst um, used to come to that flat two or three evenings a week and read from his compilation. The reason he was in London was to try and get this compilation published. At that time, this is 1969, so many of the resources that we have about um, Schöbendorn mother's vision were not available, but he had collected from all available uh, published sources and arranged um, his compilation on the psychology of the integral yoga. And so everything about the planes and parts of the being, each one examined in detail, both from mother and from, from Sri Aurobindo. So he was coming in the evenings and uh, this group of young people would sit around and listen. And I was just soaking all that up like a sponge. It was so marvelous. Did you make any contacts with people who were there that remained? That came a little later. Of course, on that um, first meeting, one person who was present is Dick Batstone, oh. who you must have known. Oh, and yes. He was in yes. charge of the uh, London Schreibindor Centre in Bell Street, where we started going. And through him, we met some of those older people, uh, Morwenna Donnelly, oh, you did? and uh, Edith see. and Joy. Oh, and um, Schnapper. Schnapper, Edith yes. Schnapper and Joy yes. Calvert. Yes. And um, hmm. Margaret Fletcher was a very important person for us, uh, living not far away in London. And she was like a kind of auntie to all the young people. And the people who came from Pondicherry to London, she used to look after them. Ah. In Huta's book, she has uh, written about how important. Auntie Margaret was to her. Yeah. And uh, had Morwenna Donnelly had already written her book? She'd already written her book. And One other thing I should tell you about that time was that uh, when we learned a little bit more about Sri Aurobindo, uh, I discovered that where I was living was just across the road from St. Paul's School, where it stood very prominently in a field by itself, and I used to pass it every day on my way to and from work. And um, just a little way away was the Cromwell Road and we looked for the, the house where he had stayed there. So that was, was interesting. And that group there in, um, in London and Cambridge, they were based a lot in Cambridge, mm -hmm. they had been formed by Purani oh. when he was in London in the 50s. And I think I didn't meet Aurobindo Basu at that time, but he was already then teaching in the University of Dur Durham. Durham, and yes. And he was yes. an important member of that small group of Aurobindonians in London in the 60s. He, he told me that he had written to Sri Aurobindo uh, asking to come to the ashram. Yes. And Sri Aurobindo said, I've spoken with mother and we think you should see a bit more of the world. Mm -hmm. And it was 16 years before they let him come. <laughs> it's 1968, he came. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at this point now in your life, what is happening? Now? No, at, there. at the age yes, of 26, at that, 27. At 26, 27. Yes. Yes, well, I felt the synthesis of, the, of yoga gave me uh, and the overall vision of Sri Aurobindo, which Jobst had shared with us, um, that gave me everything I needed to live the rest of my life. And I didn't, um, I didn't feel the need to go anywhere or do anything different. Uh, just one has to live what has been given. But my, my partner was very eager not to continue living in London not to continue living in England. In fact, we had already left England and done a lot of traveling, and it was more or less an accident that we were there at that time. Mm. 
So, as I say, there weren't any bookshops where we could buy a book by Sri Aurobindo, so we had to contact a gentleman that none of us must know, Carlo Schulle, who uh, lived in Zurich. Yes. And he was the distributor at that time for Sri Aurobindo's books all over Europe. And so Jobst wrote to him and told him what we wanted and what he went wanted. And when the um, packet of books arrived, it also along with it was the first literature about Oroville, which had just been founded the year before, on February 68. Yes. So it, well, Jobst also was seeing all that material for the first time. And when my husband saw that stuff, he said, that's it, that's the place, that's where we must go. So Jobs told us, well, then you must have your photographs taken and you must write to the mother. So we, had our, we took our photographs in one of those little booths, you know, and Jobs thought we were being ridiculous to <laughs> you're sending photographs to the mother and you do it in one of those machines. <laughs> but uh, we were young and naive, that's what we did. We wrote to her and uh, that we've heard about Oroville and we'd be very interested to come. So we got a letter back, not from the mother, but from Navajata. Uh, it must have, it was from Navajata, from society, but it must have been uh, signed by somebody else, I suppose. Um, saying that the mother has accepted you for Oroville, but it's no use coming just now. Please wait some time. Interesting. So we we wrote back and said, are you going to let us know when it's time or uh, must we write again? And the second answer came back saying, we will let you know, but you are also free to write uh, if you wish. So then, so then mm. what happened then? Then, well, there were, as I say, a small group of us. And uh, in this group, there was the idea, uh, since we couldn't go immediately to Oroville, um, to start a small commune somewhere in the country, out of the town. And we set off in a traveler van and uh, well, I won't go into all the details, but we, we found eventually, uh, quite uh, in the northwest, in beautiful country, oh. in the most go glorious place. When I think back now, how magical it was. It was like something out of the Lord of the Rings. Oh, what and was in the area? <laughs> it's southwest of Manchester. Oh. And now it's actually already Stockbroker Bells, oh. that field where we live. It's completely yeah. lived, it's completely <laughs> spoiled. But at that time, it was really untouched um, countryside, English countryside. There was a river mm. and um, beautiful meadows all around. And there was a little 300-year-old stone cottage in a garden. And we were able to, uh, to move in there. And we devoted ourselves to handicrafts. And we walked to the local market town. Um, every second week or so to do our shopping and to sell our produce. <laughs> and we had a friend in London who used to take things to London and sell and bring us back things. Did you have a name for the place? <laughs> it was called The Pingle. The, the, the house was called The Pingle and the village was called Winkle. And it was near a place called Wild Boar Clough, which uh, I'd been hearing about. I grew up not far from that oh. area. Wild Boar Clough, it was, it seemed to me, a very, um, a clough is a, a cleft, a valley. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very thrilled to be living near Wild Boar Clough. We used to go walking in that direction. And there were no more wild boars there, but there were kangaroos. Mm. There were wallabies. We actually saw them. Anyway, this has nothing at all to do with Shelby. No, How did there come to fine. be wallabies in Northwest really, England? Really, that's the question. <laughs> Somebody no. had had a private yeah. zoo, and there was a terrible winter, and the snow filled up all the enclosures, and the animals 
wandered out and they had all disappeared except the wallabies. Who had How long did you stay there? About a year, I think. Yeah. And then? And then one day I received a postcard from Jobst from the airport in Munich, he was leaving, saying, leaving for Oroville, hope to see you there soon. And all the rest of the group had been saying, it's time, we have to go to India now, we have to go to India. So they were all planning to go over land. And I said, I've done that trip three times already. I do not want to do it again if I'm going to India. I want to go by air. So they kindly bought me a ticket and I came on ahead and uh, arrived here 44 years ago. Uh, November 12, 1970 hmm. is when I arrived in Pondicherry. Tell me about your time in Pondicherry, or did you move out to Oroville soon, soon after? I moved out to Oroville on the 19th of November. Oh. I was in Parc au Charbon for, Park, now Park Guest House, right. for just one week. Did you meet Mother at that time? Yes. In those days, when t in order to join Oroville, uh, you had to have uh, a photograph taken. I had a new photograph taken on Nehru Street. He took a very, very flattering uh, portrait of me. And there was an application form to be filled in, in which all the questions that the entry group ask you nowadays, they, they were there. And um, we had to take it to one of three people. One of the people was Monsieur André Morisset, the mother's son. And another one was Navajab and the other one was Roger Angers, the architect of Oroville. And Jobst, out of his background, advised me to go to Roger. And he took me to meet Roger in his then office, a beautiful old Pondicherian building, which had been the State Bank building, near to where Reggie's guest house yes. later was. Beautiful place. Yeah old Pondicherry house with big garden and pillars and so on. And on the first floor there was the Lavenir de Hauville, the architect's office. And that's where I met him. And when he had a look at my application form, he saw that I had done some work with children. I never wanted to be a teacher, but in the course of my journeyings and so on. I had done some teaching and I had been looking after children uh, as an au pair. Mm. So he said, oh, mother's pushing us, we have to start a school in Oroville. You can do that, he said. So he was so sure that I could start the school in Oroville that he took me to see the mother at his time. He used to see her every morning at um, nine o'clock, I believe. Yes. And um, so on Friday, I think it was a Friday, November 19th, um, we met at the ashram and he took me upstairs with him. I had to sit on the stairs leading up to mother's room, the inside Until stair. Until you were called until I was called. He yes. went ahead. And there were other people <coughs> sitting there, but mm -hmm. he went ahead because it was his time. And I was somewhere in the middle. And um, after some time, my name was called. I'd been given a funny little bedraggled bouquet of flowers at the last minute. They told me, you, you haven't any flowers? And they took me to the flower room, oh. but everything had already gone. No, I don't know what funny little bouquet. I felt very strange about it. And of course, I'd been thinking of telling her my whole story. But um, they told me, we don't speak. You don't speak to mother. You just uh, let her look into your eyes and she will need know everything she needs to know about you. So... That's what I did. 
You knelt before her? I knelt before her. I didn't have... I mean, I didn't feel that I was having any overwhelming experience at that time. I looked at her and she looked at me. I felt very happy to be there. And um, then she gave me a white rose and I realized now it's time to go. And I touched her feet and I always feel bad because I think I touched her feet too hard. I should, Nowadays I hear that mother had bruises you know, from people touching her feet. I feel very sorry about that. But then I just drifted out of the room and I, everything was gone. I had forgotten completely about Roger and Oroville and everything. I was just drifting and Roger had to come running after me and somebody else had to come running after me because I'd left my bag behind somewhere. But he said, um, Mother says yes. And that was a very, very special moment of meeting with uh, Roger. I realized that uh, somehow the psychic being must have been open. And at that moment we had a, a contact which uh, lasted throughout his life. Although we were, never, we were never very close, but somehow that thing was always yeah. there. Yeah. And down at the bottom in uh, the courtyard, uh, Jobst was waiting for me and he was very happy that Mother had said yes. And so he took me to meet uh, Monsieur André, who had his room yes. uh, on the other, yeah. the, the west side of the Samadhi courtyard. Right, right. And um, he said, you want to go to Oroville? He said, in aspiration, they are living three people to a room. Yeah. You know, there were some. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, right. you can't imagine what it was like. They had just gone up these rooms, single rooms. There were two single rooms joined, and a bathroom in between. Yeah. And in each of those single rooms, maybe there were twenty-five or thirty, three people living in each of them. The keyed huts, in the keyed roofs. Or did had the, Roger already designed? No, the first Piero had prepared Piero. those uh, first square huts, and there were small ones and there were big ones. Mm -hmm. But I think at that time the big ones hadn't been built; there were only small ones, and it was a completely bare field. But the cafeteria was there. I'll tell you about that later. But um, anyway, but Jobst himself was not living in one of those um, small huts. Um, there were three bigger round huts standing where the perfume factory is now. And he'd been given one of those huts. There's an amusing story about that, but he said, um, I can stay with him. So Monsieur André accepted that and gave me permission to move to Aspiration. And he sent us just across the road, the house on the corner. It belonged to Purna Prema, mother's yes, granddaughter. Yes, yes. But at that time she wasn't living there. It was the Oroville office. Okay. And downstairs at the front, um, looking towards the ashram, there was a room with an exhibition about I Oroville. remember it well. And Navajat had an office upstairs. <laughs> Shushila used to sit up there. I had already been there when I arrived the very first day they had sent me to meet Shushila. And at the back there was Henry Bell, whom you might remember, who was in charge of Oroville Transport. He was somebody who'd come from East Africa with his wife and uh, daughter. Maybe there was more than one daughter. I remember one daughter. He composed the Oroville song, which nobody now remembers. I can't remember it, but he had it. And he was in charge of transport out to Oroville. And um, he said, well, it's pouring with rain. I forgot that detail. It was oh. pouring with rain. I don't know whether they'll be able to get down the canyon, but if they can, they'll be here by 11.30, oh. and you can go with them. Was, what was his name, Louis, the driver? The, uh, Louis drove the bus. Oh, he drove the bus. But um, it was Jean-Claude, electrician Jean-Claude, oh. who was driving a really beaten up, absolutely stripped down 
white Citroen van, which was the standard transport before the school bus. Yes. And um, so I got into that and, and arrived at uh, Aspiration in the cafeteria just at lunchtime, I think, mm. about to be lunchtime. And Navudit came out and met me. Oh. Um, he was the secretary for Aspiration in those days. And he'd been informed that I was coming and my name, and he told me that I'm number 54. And that meant 54 um, on the list of residents of Oroville. <laughs> that mother had accepted me, and that I was, yeah. So you moved in with Joost? I moved, no, well, the sad thing about Joost was, uh, during the night, with the heavy rain, uh, his hut had fallen down. It had been only half thatched, and when the roof is half thatched, yeah. if it gets wet, the whole hut collapses. So he had been assigned another of those round rooms, but Navadit's wife, Alice, was convinced that that room was her sewing room. It has been built to be her sewing room. So Jobs and I were allowed to sleep there, but during the day, she made a point of sitting there. And that was her sewing room. She was in charge of prosperity distribution. So you were there when the large French contingent came? No, no, no. They had come earlier. They were there. They were there? Yes, okay. they had come a year earlier. A year earlier. Okay. I think 69, no? Yeah. And those uh, conversations, That's mothers... When I came. Uh, yes. Aspiration talks mm -hmm. were held with members of that, of that group. group. Yes, yeah. yes. So they were there, and, um, um, and Christoph Bhagavan was Das, also there. Christoph was also yes, there. Yes, yes, yes. Stephen Walton. Yeah, oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, they were building last school at that time, as well as these larger huts for Aspiration. All that was going on at that time. And the school hadn't yet been started, but I was very relieved to find that I don't have to start the school. Rod Hemsel was there, oh. and a very nice German lady, Ursula Pflug. Ursula, and yes, I remember Ursula very well. They, they were holding classes oh. for the children who lived in Aspiration, mm -hmm. which was Rose Monnier and um, Gopal. In those days, he was Pascal who had come with, um, with his mother, Miriam. And there were some local Tamil children, Tandapani from Four Tamas, oh. who's still an important figure <laughs> here, yes, yes. Yes. and others. And uh, the first children of the integrated families, the older generation, so this means um, Ravi, who's at the looking after health center, and Rama, who runs the solar service, and um, there was one more. And then their younger siblings mm -hmm. started to join us. But it was the, uh, when I arrived, it was just the older ones who were uh, going to these classes, learning to read. With, uh, so when, with did you, okay. when did you finally begin teaching? Yes, well, meanwhile, of course, uh, the school was getting organized. Mm -hmm. And uh, Norman Dowsett was put in charge of it. Uh -huh. And um, the school was opened on the 16th of December that same year. So just a few days mm -hmm. after I arrived. In between came my first darshan in November 24. And that's when I saw mother on the balcony for the first time. And on that day again I had one of these very special inner experiences when we crammed into that uh, white Citroen van after seeing mother on the balcony to go back. And by then it was getting dark 
and really we were all like crammed in like in the tube in London, standing up, no, no sitting room, anything. And I didn't know any of them, but I had the feeling that all these people are closer to me than everybody else I've known in my life. Closer to me than my family, my relatives, everybody I've known because of mother. We are all here because of mother. Very special moment of gratitude. Yes, yes. Yeah, and then the school started. Conditions must not have been very easy at that time. Hastily, uh, a Keat hut had been put up um, where the press now stands. Mm. And, um, or m m maybe a, a bit further east, it's still, actually, I think everything was is now covered by Maroma. Um, they had done nice cement floors. It was all clean, but it was practically bare. And uh, Norman had managed to get hold of some of the prosperity beds. In those days, if you came to Oroville, um, you, nobody was allowed to stay overnight in Oroville unless they had permission from the mother. And she strongly discouraged us from having visitors and friends and so on. So really, if you were here, you were supposed to have been approved. And when you were approved, you got issued uh, a bed with had folding legs. It's a really good design. I still have two, not prosperity beds, but made according to the same design in my house, single beds. And a special chair, um, a special table that with a couple of drawers and a, just a very simple chair that went with it. So that was your, your setup. Mm. So he'd got hold of some of those beds that we could um, use as tables. We could sit on the floor and use them as tables. And Anurakta from the handmade paper factory had given us stacks of beautiful covered handmade paper. And somebody else had got a hold of a lot of scissors. So that's what there was to do, actually. It was to cut up all that beautiful paper and see what we could do with it. But we started with a, a little, well, first of all, of course, Monsieur André was there and he cut the ribbon and he gave us Mother's message, which was about the languages, the four languages of Oracle. Somebody had asked Mother what, what languages are to be taught in Orville School. Mm. That's when she mentioned Sanskrit. That's when she said, first of all, Tamil as the local language, right. and um, French, French, and Sanskrit as the future language of India, and English as the international language. Mm. Yeah. So these are, so remain the four languages of Orville. So that message was given on that day, and Norman had very, very nicely arranged that we should start with a lesson in Sanskrit. So um, Elia, who now is at the be at Society Beach office, she was living in aspiration, or perhaps she wasn't living in aspiration at that time. She must have come in the school bus, which I'll say something about mm. later. and. Um, she was a Hindi speaker, and perhaps she knew a little Sanskrit, and she taught us all to say, Buddham Sharanam Kachami. I take refuge in the Buddha. Gachami means I go. So this was the first verb in Sanskrit. And I remember when I was a teenager, I thought, one day I'm going to have to learn Sanskrit. But when I heard that language for the first time, it was also so moving. And uh, later on, we had a, a real Sanskrit scholar who worked with us, Ganga, she and her husband, Krishna Aya. They lived in Promise. They came a little later. 
and eventually they left for New Zealand. But she, she really knew Sanskrit, so she gave us Sanskrit lessons. And later on, as the school developed, it became a, a feature that um, there would be an assembly every morning and we would sing Sanskrit songs mm. together and Deepshika used to oh. lead us for uh. that. But that was uh, probably a year or more later. So the school bus, since it's been yes. mentioned a yes, couple please, of times, please. No, I think <laughs> it must have made its first appearance on that day, on the 16th of December 1970, with uh, Louis Swamy, who was Louis. a gigantic yeah. Tamil uh, middle-aged man, at least that's what he seemed to me then. One, one eye. And, uh, I remember his one eye. <laughs> I didn't remember, he only had one eye, but he was a good driver. Oh. And this, uh, this bus was painted blue, and on this vast empty plain of Oroville, you can't imagine what it was like in those days, um, with our two or three roads, yeah. this bus would approach like a blue dragon with a big cloud of dust yeah. on he would be hooting the horn. And the real function of the bus was to bring the children to school. Many of the children were still living with their families. Many of the families that had been accepted for Orville were still living in Pondicherry. And because of that, a kitchen had been set up there uh, where the beach of or Shobindo Society beach office now stands. There was the prosperity office. Prabha Ben was in charge of it. And she had set up this kitchen Mm. where the Aurevillians who were living in Pondicherry could get their meals. And Aurevillians who were living in Auroville, uh, when they came to Pondy for, uh, went to Pondy for work, they could also get their lunch there. And there was even a place, a keat shade on the roof where you could rest until it was time for the bus to come back to Auroville at four o'clock in the afternoon yeah. to pick up the children and take them back to Pondy. So, and on the way from Pondi, it would go up the Jitma Hill, past Promise. There were several children living there. Piero and Gloria were I there. I lived next door to Piero and Gloria. So you were living there? Yes. Yes. So, um, at first there was Marta, her <coughs> elder, the, their mm -hmm. elder daughter, and then... Miriam? The, Miriam, Miriam came, came about a year later. She uh, came in September 71. Mm -hmm. There was Marta, but there was Raphael. He was living with his parents at Oro Orchard. And, uh, yes, yes, yes. They were from New Caledonia. Exactly. Yes, yes. They were working with And Gerard. his father was an organic gardener. Exactly, yeah. Yes. So Raphael must have been about seven or eight he at that seven time. at that time, yes. Mm -hmm. And there were Mercier. Mercier was Mercier his father, was right? Yes. yes. Bumiwala was living there, and he mm. had two boys. Popo and Pippi lived there for a while. Mm. Yes, but, but they didn't exactly. have any children. No, no they didn't. No. Mm. But uh, the, I'm t thinking about the kids who were coming uh -huh. to the school. There were these two. Bumi. He, he was called Bumiwala. No. Bumi. Yes. What was his son called? Jehangir, no, Jehangir was another boy. Rishad and Jehangir came later also, possibly. Anyway, and then it passed by um, certitude, and there were Shama's children. There was, uh, right. we called him Taddy in those days, Daddy, now he's right. Erisa, and uh, Hero, and Renu. And Renu. These yes. three, yeah. And later on, um, at the workers' camp, Matrimandia workers' camp, but that wasn't founded then, that came also about a year later. Um, there was Jack and Mary Alexander and right. their um, son Sa Satya. Satya, Satya, Satya yes. Mm -hmm. So like that, they were picking up kids from around and then the kids who came from Pondi. So the bus arrived and that's when school started every morning. Let's take a few minutes break okay. and we'll continue 